I'll just talk while um, we're setting up. Thanks very much for inviting me to speak at this conference. Um, okay, great. And in particular, thanks to Adam Ford and to Peter McIntyre for asking me to talk here. It's very nice to follow after Peter Singer. Peter was my boss for the first 10 years at the centre there at Monash, uh, which Peter established in 1980. So um, I haven't been all that involved in the effective altruism movement myself, um, so it's really nice to be able to think more about the kinds of issues that are raised there, having spoken, you know, I guess over the years to Peter and also to others who are involved in the movement. So when I was asked to talk at this conference, I was asked to think about it from the perspective that I take in ethics, which is known as virtue ethics, and see what might be said about the kinds of ideas that effective altruists have and that the movement puts forward. So what I'm going to do in this short talk is to say a little bit about the way that virtue ethics could endorse at least some of those ideas, uh, but also express a few reservations about it uh, and a few of what you might think of as the limitations of this approach. So I'd be keen to hear when we have the panel discussion if you have any comments on, on that part of the talk in particular. Okay, good. So I thought what I would do to start with is to just tell you a little bit about virtue ethics. So I realise it's a pretty mixed audience that we've got here. So I've just got um, a couple of slides on this. Um, the approach to virtue ethics that I've been most influenced by and that I find to be most plausible is that that derives from the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. There's some key ideas that he has that I think differentiate this approach from a more utilitarian approach, which I realise not all a view involved in the effective altruism movement take, but I think is nonetheless worth emphasising. One of the key ideas that Aristotle has is that when you think about right action, the way to judge whether an action is right is whether or not it's in accordance with what a virtuous person would do in the circumstances. So it's very much focused on the character of the person who's acting. And in doing so, it focuses very much on the motivation uh, that they have when they act. Uh, the other key idea in, that you find in Aristotelian virtue ethics is that when we think of the human good, we think about it not only in terms of, let's say, pleasure or preference satisfaction, but in terms of what's known as human flourishing. So at least the Aristotelian form of virtue ethics is very much based on an account of human nature. And you know, the idea that Aristotle has is that we live best when we live in accordance with our nature, and to do that, we need to develop a whole range of character traits, which he calls virtues, but also to have certain what he calls external goods like friendship and health. Here's a couple of examples of what he talks about as virtues, that it's right to save another person's life where continued life would still be a good to that person because that's what someone with a virtue of benevolence would do. Uh, it's ordinarily right to keep a promise made to someone on their deathbed, even though living people would benefit from its being broken, because that's what a person with a virtue of justice would do. Um, so a couple of things I wanted to emphasise about this approach. And one is that, as I mentioned before, in a lot of cases of right action, the action only is right if it's done from a particular character trait or a particular motive. Uh, so that is a pretty demanding standard for right action because of the inner dimension to right action that it has. Um, but also it has a sort of pluralistic view of value. And so it thinks of what is good and what counts as a flourishing life in terms of a range of different goods. And you can't just reduce the good of one to the other. And so if you take the Aristotelian approach to this, you know, a flourishing life involves having things like friendship, but also having things like you know, pleasure, um, autonomy, understanding of the world. Um, so you can't just reduce them all to a single value. OK, so what I thought might be useful is to just tell you a little bit about what Aristotle thought about what he called the virtue of liberality, sometimes translated as the virtue of you know, generosity. And I was intrigued when I went back to Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics to discover that a lot of what he says about that virtue, which is one concerned with the giving of money and one's kind of possessions to others, is pretty consistent with what's being said by you know, the EA movement. So um, here's some quotes where he talks about liberality. Um, now he says that the liberal person doesn't value wealth for its own sake. 
um, and it's the mark of the liberal man or the liberal person to give to the right people but also from the right motives, with, with pleasure or without pain. They'll refrain from giving to just anybody and everybody and that such a person may have something to give to the right people at the right time. This is a common Aristotelian idea that the virtues require acting from the right motives and doing so at the right time with the right people and so on. He also thinks that it's relative to the resources that you have and so he says that the term liberality is used in a way that's relative to a man's substance and he says it's relative to how much you have, the giver's substance and there's therefore really nothing to prevent the man who gives less from being the more liberal man if he has less to give. And so I think, you know, sometimes with the EA movement, from what I've seen, there's a bit of a discussion about not being too influenced by the charities that tug at one's heartstrings. But I think if you consider the virtue of liberality, it's important to give from the right motives. And so you can give with both head and heart, uh, but not in the manner of what Aristotle calls the prodigal person. And if you, if you think about the way that all virtues for Aristotle are a mean in between twin vices and so you can have the vice of prodigality which is when you give unwisely um, and so he thinks that if you give with both the head and the heart but not in the manner of the prodigal person who has an appetite for giving but they don't mind how so it's not the mark of a wicked or ignoble man to go to excess in giving but only of a foolish one talks a bit more about meanness, uh, which manifests as a sordid love of gain and is an even greater evil than, he says, than prodigality. And then he gets on to the next part of the book where he talks about the virtue of magnificence, which is uh, broader than just giving of money. And um, says, the magnificent man will do so gladly and lavishly for nice calculation is a niggardly thing. So they won't calculate too much. Um, I'm not sure what you think about that last virtue, but you could also look at what Aristotle says about justice in the politics as perhaps supporting the ideas in effective altruism because one of at least my interpretation of what Aristotle is arguing in his work in the politics is this quote here, that the form of government is best in which every man, whoever he is, can act best and live happily. Now, there's a lot of different ways of interpreting that comment and the context of it. But I think what he means is that a just state would be one that would enable us to have the character traits and have the resources to be able to live well. And so this requires not only broadest kind of structural reforms, but also support for us as individuals to be able to develop the virtues of liberality, for example. Okay, so. You know, having sketched a bit of overlap between my understanding of virtue ethics and the ideas of effective altruism, I wanted to express some possible differences between them and, you know, some possible perhaps reservations that you might have about the effective altruism movement from the perspective of virtue ethics. And one is that, as it might have already um, you know, become clear from what I've said, things like friendships and personal relationships are really important and part of a humanly flourishing life for virtue ethicists. So one of the things that I think is important to bear in mind is the value of things like family caregiving. And that's something that's very difficult to quantify, perhaps, in terms of how effective it is or to compare with the other good you might do with your time. But it can obviously be quite a demanding thing for people to do. And I suppose in cases where you know, often the adult children, I suppose most commonly adult daughters, you know, are providing this sort of care. I think it's important that its value be recognised uh, and not undervalued. And I suppose part of that too is that, you know, you might think, oh, well, why should the care always have to be provided by the child? And of course it needn't be, but often with an elderly parent, they see it as having a particular kind of value when the care is given to them by a child um, rather than by a professional carer. What I'll probably spend most time on is talking about career choice. So um, I gave a commentary on Will McCaskill's um, talk, the very first paper he wrote about the ethics of career choice in Oxford in 2012 at the Society of Applied Philosophy Conference. And so in my commentary, I thought, a fair bit about um, what other philosophers have written on career choice and 
one uh, not so well-known utilitarian who wrote on the ethics of career choice is Hastings Rashdale. So I wanted to try to uh, just bring up this idea about ethical career choices and say a bit more about Will's argument, but also express uh, you know, concern and maybe emphasise the importance of uh, the value of personal fulfilment playing a role in what counts as an ethical career choice. So I've got a lot of, I've got two very long quotes on this slide. Um, in that paper that got published in 2014, Will McCaskill wrote, it's ethically preferable to pursue philanthropy through a higher paid but morally controversial career, like being a merchant banker, than it is to pursue philanthropy through a lower paid but morally innocuous career, like being a charity worker or an aid worker. Um, so, I mean, one obvious example of how you could have someone who thought that they were being an effective altruist, while not a utilitarian, is Albert Schweitzer. Um, and Albert Schweitzer, specifically trained in medicine, in tropical medicine, because he thought he could do enormous good for the world through working in the Belgian Congo uh, and through the prevention of things like malaria in as much as that was possible at that time. And, you know, it's interesting when you read Schweitzer's autobiography, he talks a lot about the impatience he has with other people at the time in Germany when he would go back there who said, oh, look, you know, what difference can one person make to the world? And often would talk about the difference he made through his own work. So here's a long quote from Schweitzer that illustrates that quite well. He said, let no one say, suppose the fellowship of those who bear the mark of pain does by way of beginning send one doctor here, another there. What's that to cope with the misery of the world? From my experience and from that of all colonial doctors, I answer that a single doctor out here with the most modest equipment means very much for very many. The good which he can accomplish surpasses a hundredfold what he gives of his own life and the cost of the material support which he must have. Just as with quinine and arsenic for malaria, with nevasinobenzol for the various diseases which spread through ulcerating sores, with emetin for dysentery and with sufficient skill and apparatus for the most necessary operations, he can in a single year free from the power of suffering and death hundreds of men who must otherwise have succumbed to their fate in despair. It's just exactly the advance of tropical medicine during the last 15 years which gives us a power over the sufferings of the men of far off lands that borders on the miraculous. Is not this really a call to us? So that's very much the idea of effective altruism but thought of perhaps more narrowly in the way that will thinks of it and the way that we're perhaps thinking about it here now. Um, so thinking about career choice in that slightly broader way that we might now is an idea that Hastings Rashdall came up with in his book The Theory of Good and Evil in 1924. And it's quite a sort of interesting way that he spells this out. And in the next slide I'm going to express a reservation about it. But um, the way that he spells it out is that he tries to factor in what he thought of as people's temperament. You know, each individual has a different temperament, he thought, and some are, are more able to perhaps do the sorts of things that Schweitzer did than others are. Um, and so the way that Rashdahl thought about the ethical obligation in terms of career choice is he said, well, common sense agrees with Roman Catholic moral theology in recognising that it would be positively wrong for anyone to enter upon certain careers which make great demands upon, their, upon the moral nature merely from a strong sense of duty when they have no internal vocation for them. The average sister of mercy is no doubt a more valuable member of society than a Belgravian lady who is somewhat above the average, but a sister of mercy with no natural love or instinct for her work, with, uh, with no natural love for the poor or the sick or the young to whom she ministered would be far less useful to society than the Belgravian lady who performs respectably the recognised duties of her station, even though she may devote what must in the abstract be considered a somewhat excessive amount of time to domestic trivialities and social dissipation. That was 1924. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I'm sure you can see his point there in any case, that, um, you know, we shouldn't be too quick to judge that someone isn't doing so much good for the world, even if they're focusing a little bit closer at home. I don't know about the Belgravian lady example, but we can think of better examples than that. Um, so, thinking about the value of personal fulfilment uh, and how it might be compared with the value, um, say, with the good that you might do for the world, and think about whether it should just be swept up 
in the way that it could be, say, an 80,000 hours um, approach, or whether or not it should be thought of as a separate value that needs to be somehow accommodated in terms of the most good you could do. Um, so, you know, I'd like to argue that uh, in terms of ethical career choices, we should be making some allowance for personal fulfilment there. And I'm aware that, um, as Peter was saying, and um, as a number of the people that he mentioned have said, it's very personally fulfilling um, to be aware of how much good you're doing for the world through the career and the earnings that you have. Um, but I think, nonetheless, there can be cases of people who aren't doing as much good for the world in that sense, but find their careers more personally fulfilling. And I suppose I want to try and defend that with a couple of examples here, um, more abstract examples. So one would be where you compare a choice between two careers that would have equal social utility, broadly understood, but one job's more personally fulfilling than the other. And I mean, this is just sort of putting the claim to you. I think that there's, um, there, seems to be <coughs> there seems to be ethical reason to choose the more fulfilling job. To me, it doesn't seem unethical to choose the, fulfill the more fulfilling job, other things being equal. But to take a different comparison, what about comparing a person who's taking a moderately lucrative sort of professional philanthropy job in the private sector, which they find mildly interesting, <laughs> and a person who delivers a little less help, maybe via a, a charity job, sort of taking on board some of the arguments that Will has given, but finds it very personally fulfilling? Uh, to me, it's not obvious that the latter is, less, is perhaps less ethical than the former. And so, to me, that would suggest that maybe personal fulf fulfilment is a value might be independent of the other good that we're talking about and that it's not so sort of counterintuitive to try to accommodate it to some extent. <clears throat> More to the point, and this is the um, slide that I'm going to end with and the example I'm going to give you, one of the things that occurred to me when I first heard about 80,000 hours was um, that, sure, you maybe the average person spends 80,000 hours uh, in their career, um, but you'd spend, according to the uh, current ABS uh, you know, statistics of the marriage length in Australia, the average length of marriage is 12.1 years here. So if you calculate that in terms of hours, including hours sleeping, it's uh, 100,000 hours. So, I mean, this is a little bit tongue in cheek. It's partly serious that, you know, I mean, say if someone did design a website and did have a campaign where they said, okay, um, think of the amount of time you spend um, doing things with your partner. Um, you could actually make your partner choices, life partnering choices, much better for the world if two people, if everyone just puts in their you know, details into this website and you could make a more ethical life partnering choice uh, because you could be a better team for the world, um, not just uh, be a great um, couple for yourselves. So I don't know how feasible this is, but the reason I'm bringing it up, <laughs> the, so, so the reason I'm bringing it up is because um, to me, uh, if you had again a comparison between, you know, you could choose to be with someone, you know, with whom you could do the most good for the world, but you weren't quite as personally attracted to them as someone else, who you mightn't be doing as much good for the world. To me, it doesn't seem obvious that you know it's unethical to choose the person who, with whom you'd be the suboptimal team that you are perhaps nonetheless a little more attracted to. So, you know, having reasons of personal fulfilment for weighing in with the ethics of career choice is one thing. Having reasons of personal attraction weighing into partnering choices is another thing. So I'm not saying you have to agree with both, um, but I do think intuitively a lot of people would think, well you know, personal attraction needs to be able to play a role in one's life partnering choices. So who knows whether there'll be 100,000 hours or more. <laughs> but uh, it will be interesting to see what the implications of it are at the time. And there's a list of my references. So thank you very much.